Okay, thank you. Again, thanks to the organizers. It's uh, nice to be here in Taiwan for the first time. Um, I'm going to give sort of an overview of um, work in the past year or two and um, work in progress and to kind of to develop some, extend the ADSCFT dictionary, you could say, with the theme towards um, eventually answering attacking some questions. Okay, so let me, let me start with a little bit of um, motivation. So, um, right, so ADSCFT, of course, is very powerful. We have a well-defined dictionary that allows us to compute things like um, spectrum of operators in the bulk of comparative spectrum of operators in CFT, and to compute you know, correlation functions in CFT and that these weight diagrams. But um, one way to get more sophisticated here, there's additional structure, say correlation functions in terms of conformal blocks that we'll discuss. And we'd like to be able to understand how to map uh, those objects. And, um, and the reason we're doing this, we want to get as much power as we can. So we, we, we'd like to you know, make progress in using the ADCMT to answer some of the questions we might be answering involving, say, quantum gravity. And um, so here the focus is going to be on uh, non perturbative. Uh, CFT and block expansion and modular invariance. These are some of the key uh, properties that uh, work. And um, these, of course, are you know, well understood from the point of view of formal field theory, but um, you know, the goal is to understand better how these ideas are realized in the bulk gravity description. So um, here's one interesting kind of target problem that I see off in the, still a little bit off in the distance. It's more motivational. I'm not going to actually really shed any light on this on this question, but it is what motivates me to develop the subject. And um, so this is this is of course the black hole information paradox, but um, in particular, um, it's more I'd say um, precise version of it that was um, put forward by Michael Singh uh, uh, years ago or something, ten years ago maybe. Um, and the, the, the advantage of this formulation of the um, Paradox, it doesn't rely on sort of um, uh, somewhat ambiguous questions about what happens to observers when they cross horizons, which is hard to formulate in CFT. This is a formulation which makes perfect sense in CFT. And the idea is to consider some um, black hole, the, the nice Lorentzian black hole, so it can be a, a confusing black hole in the um, history. And then we look at some two point function um, as a function of time, so the two operators, as a function of time separation, here are the various times. And it's simply a fact that you compute this in the bulk using the standard um, you know, Witten diagram technology. And you will find that this correlation function decays exponentially to zero as time goes to infinity as we go up here. And um, there's a simple physical reason for that. As you as time is larger and larger, you can think of some it's a geodesic approximation. You're probing closer and closer to the horizon. And effectively, you <coughs> the correlations are being lost through the horizons of the correlators measuring the boundaries decaying to zero. Okay? But on the other hand, we know that such behavior cannot occur in a healthy CFT. So in particular, if you have a formal field theory, um, say in a compact space, and it has a finite uh, central charge or finite n, depending on the context, um, it's simply a fact that correlations like this cannot decay down to zero. What we know is going to happen generically is the correlator will start decaying. And it decays down to something very, very small, like e to the minus the um, entropy of the system here at finite temperature. And then it'll, it'll be very small, and it'll do some strange things, and it's really fuzzy. And then it'll eventually actually recur back to its previous, essential, almost periodically back to the previous value, and then it'll just repeat. And the recurrence time scale is a very long time scale, essentially, to the S. And, and the reason, again, for this on the CFT side is very simple. The, the CFT has some, some discrete spectrum. <laughs> And so correlators are approximately periodic. You can, you can more or less prove this. And so, of course, the question is, um, you know, this regime here where things are not decaying down to zero, how do we make sense of that in, in the bulk language? So what, what bulk effect could yield this sort of picture? And there have been some proposals for this. None of them are really satisfactory. But it's key. I mean, it, it's pretty clear that the main thing we have to understand is um, the CFT, what causes the CFT is this discrete spectrum. So there's like some energy gap from the vacuum to the first excited state. Whereas for a black hole, we have this infinite redshift and there's no energy gap. So we need some description that puts in, that allows us to assign an energy gap to a black hole. Okay. And um, it's not, okay, there are various ways of trying to attack this directly. 
but as you'll see maybe towards the end of this talk, think about this in terms of correlators and control and block expansion can be, can be a powerful way to approach this. Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about um, informal blocks. This is an old um, subject going back uh, many decades, but uh, new things continue, new ideas and applications continue to be found. Okay, so let's, um, let's think about informal field theory abstractly, not from the point of view of a Lagrangian like we first learned about uh, in our field theory classes, but instead in terms of defining the CFT by what's known as the CFT data. And uh, what that means is I define the CFT by saying I hand you a spectrum of operators, particular primary operators, so each representation in the whole algebra are labeled by primary states of primary operators. And so these are some list of operators with some dimension spin as well. And then I also tell you the three-point functions of those primaries, or equivalently that's the operator product expansion coefficients. And um, that's actually enough information for you to compute any correlation function in theory. That's why it defines, um, defines the theory it's subject to some consistency conditions on, these, on that data. And the way that works is through the conformal block expansion. In the formal block expansion, you build up all the correlators out of the CFT data. And uh, the idea, the idea is, is represented here. So suppose we're computing some uh, four-point function, some operators. Um, so what you, what you can think of is you we're going to use the operator product expansion on this pair of operators. And on this pair of operators, now we're reduced this correlator to a sum over two-point functions. And the two-point functions are fixed by the formal symmetry. So that's represented graphically by this picture. So we're taking um, the OP of these two operators, and they're combining into operators O sub P. These are all the operators um, in the representation corresponding to the primary P. And each vertex here is the operator part of the expansion coefficient. And they have to sum over all, all primaries. So we get this sum of this. And um, the key thing is these, these functions, these are the conformal partial waves, or conformal blocks, it's the same thing. Each function here are completely fixed by conformal invariance, okay? Because the um, this block here corresponds to an exchange for primary plus all its descendants, but the form of the descendants is, is fixed by, by the conformal algebra. So these guys are totally fixed, and that means the only data that's entering here are the spectrum of operators and the OB coefficients, which is what we have here. So this, this means these, these functions are very important and powerful, but they're basically building blocks of correlation functions. But keep in mind that they're completely determined by uh, symmetry. Okay, so in a little, in a little bit more um, detail, again, so we have some uh, primary operator. Its descendants are basically derivatives of the primary successive derivatives. And now a nice way to think about this um, conformal block expansion, take this four-point function, and we're going to stick in here, our, we're sticking the identity, but the identity expresses the sum of projection operators, and each projection operator projects onto one conformal family, so the primary plus all its descendants. So then each term here, corresponding to each projector, is the conformal partial wave. So it's very similar to just, you know, usual partial wave expansions, it's now using conformal algebra. Okay, so we break up into these guys, we pull out the OP coefficients, and so this W now, the conformal partial wave, is, 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 is pulled out now, it's, it's again, it's just completely fixed by conformal symmetry. Okay, so we'd like to, these, again, these, these functions are the, are the building blocks. Now, okay, what is known about these functions? So the situation is a little bit different depending on dimensionality. So in, in dimension higher than two, of course, the conformal algebra is finite dimensional. So we have some uh, uh, SO plus two power one. Um, where if there are two dimensions, we could look at them. Uh, finite conformal algebra or it's enhanced to the inverse algebra in general. And um, the conformal blocks um, were actually originally worked out going back all the way to the 1970s and been worked by Ferraro, Chateau, Grillo, and uh, Parisi, so back in the, the mid-70s. And um, they, um, so here we're only talking about the conformal blocks of external operators are scalars, but throughout this talk that'll be true. They wrote down some pretty um, frightening looking double integral expressions for the uh, conformal blocks. I'm not even gonna try to define what the terms are here. But this, this bizarre looking object will actually end up having a very nice uh, ADS interpretation. As you look at this through ADS uh, goggles, you'll understand exactly what this thing is. 
Um, and then much later, um, Dolan Osborne, you could say, did this, did these integrals that way, but they got explicit uh, expressions for the control blocks in terms of products of hypergeometry. And again, these things are a little bit nasty looking, but key things in the sense are actually you know, known in closed form in terms of and uh, again, if they're in two dimensions, the control algebra is enhanced to Virasoro uh, across Virasoro, left and right Virasoro algebras. And that means that uh, formal blocks uh, factorize. One factor is also in Virasoro algebra. And now these, these objects are constructed using the same idea, but they're much richer objects because um, Virasoro algebra is, of course, an infinite dimensional algebra, unlike the uh, control algebra in two dimensions. And so that means that these Virasoro representations effectively contain an infinite number of global representations. So they're much richer objects, and particularly these guys now depend on the central charge of the theory. And in contrast uh, to these results here, there are no, except in some very special cases, essentially there are no closed form expressions known for these uh, Virasoro blocks. There's information known in certain limits as well. Yes. Even the, for the higher dimension of things, it's a uh, so that an upper expression is for certain limit, right? For certain even dimensions. Yeah, 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 yeah. So these hypergeometric are even dimensions, so more generally there's some. If, yeah, even dimensions, I, I think so, if it's for a certain region, like a uh, small U and. No, 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 these are, these are exact. They're, uh, there's no restriction there, but they were given, originally by them, for external scalar operators, not for spinning operators. But other than that, they're. they're uh, Um, okay, so now let's try to um, think about these in terms of anti-sitter space. And first, let's review a little bit about uh, Witten diagrams, so computation of correlation functions um, in ADS, which of course is that you want to break up the correlation function into sums over total blocks. And so we want to be thinking about a basic uh, true level exchange diagram for scalars. And at this point, um, well, there's some exchange field here. We could talk about this being some arbitrary symmetric tensor exchange, but let's just think of it as being a scalar here, not just simple. Okay, so I think um, you know, everybody here probably knows how we, how we define a diagram like this. So we attach both boundary propagators to each of the um, lines connected to the, the boundary, and then we have some bulk bullet propagator, and then we integrate the vertices or radius. It's like a Feynman diagram, um, except uh, left in your position space. Okay, let's remember what these look like a bit more explicitly. So suppose we're working at ADS and Poincaré coordinates. That's the expression for the bulk boundary propagator. It's pretty familiar. The bulk, 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 bulk propagator is a little bit more nasty. It's written in terms of um, a geometric function in general. And sigma here is the geodesic distance between the two points. And that takes a little bit of a nasty form expressed in terms of the uh, Poincaré coordinates. And so, of course, you plug all this in into this, this, these integrals here. But as you can imagine, these are going to be pretty nasty integrals. And indeed, they cannot be done in closed form. So you can basically find a special function, which is equal to that integral. So these properties as long as there's no um, explicit um, result. And um, well, actually, very, very early on in the subject, people thought a diagram like this would itself be a conformal block. It's a kind of picture, of course, of a similar mode drawing before. But it was, it was realized soon after that's not really true. If you can be one of these guys that has an expansion into a sum of them for conformal blocks and you expect a generic correlator. And it's a little bit you know, um, unpleasant to actually work out that expansion because of the tractability of these integrals, but it can be done. But it leaves the question, um, what is the bullet representation of a single conformal block itself? And that's, that's one question that we set up to answer. And it turns out, I uh, guess, uh, uh, in this uh, formula, uh, do you sum over x channel as well as p channel? We should, of course, to get the full correlator. But right now, I'm just going to be looking at this diagram by diagram. Well, uh, I'm asking this because uh, in conformal cases, if you expect things in terms of conformal blocks, you don't really have to sum over p channel, only p channel, or only x channel. Right, right. So here, here we should sum over all diagrams. But the sum over all diagrams would then have a conformal block expansion in one channel. So 
the full corollary we can spend twenty blocks and the twenty blocks time moving one channel, even though here we should compute we should compute all fine and diagrams in this in this language. Okay, now the nice thing that makes us happy is that there's a pretty simple modification of that uh, wooden diagram that does give just a single informal block. Okay, and there are various ways to, modify, to, to motivate this, but let me try to do this in the cleanest way possible. It involves the least amount of grunginess. And um, actually, this is how, let's use the formalism by which, in fact, Dolan Osborne got their nice fullest form results. And that's that the conformal blocks actually satisfy a nice differential equation. It's the um, conformal Casimir equation. And so let's go back to the definition of conformal blocks. We put in this projection operator here. And uh, we're projecting over to one conformal family. And all the members of the conformal family have the same value for the conformal Casimir operator, of course. So the conformal Casimir operator is just the, you know, these would be like the SO, SOD uh, generators, and we just square them. That's, that's the Casimir algebra, the Casimir operator for the algebra. And so you can apply this operator here, apply to the um, to these two fields, and then, and then just use a little bit of elementary shuffling around and so on. It's not hard to show that this then applies that this guy here is an eigenfunction um, of that operator, and the eigenvalue is the quadratic Casimir of the representation corresponding to the, the exchanged uh, operator. So that's the explicit uh, Casimir, there's the dimension that's in the exchange operator. Okay, then you can translate this into some differential equation and try to solve it. So uh, consider it as a uh, dimensional then. Well, this would hold the dimension two as well, but if you were only looking at the global yeah, sub-algebra. Yeah. Okay, so now um, can we translate this nice uh, uh, setup here into the bulk? And one thing you're probably familiar with is that in bulk ADS, the conformal Casimir operator is actually the bulk, is, is the uh, Laplace operator. Okay, it's the second order differential operator, it's Laplace operator. And um, recall that the bulk bulk propagator acted on the Laplace operator. Uh, is um, well, it's almost an eigenfunction, except it has this delta function source. Okay, so it's, it's a phase function, so it makes a wave equation, but with a delta function source. Okay, and so if you try to ask whether the Witten diagram is an eigenfunction of the formal Casimir operator, what you find is it's almost an eigenfunction. The trouble is this inhomogeneous term. So this inhomogeneous term kicks in when the two um, endpoints two points of the local propagator collide. And they do collide because on the Witten diagram, um, we're supposed to integrate the vertices over all of ADS, and so they're gonna collide. And that collision uh, screws up the equation. And so the diagram is not a eigenfunction, so it's not a conformal block. So um, this, this property can be fixed, however. Okay, so we want to do some essentially conformally invariant modification of the prescription, which doesn't allow the um, vertices to collide, then with an eigenfunction. And so the, the prescription is the following. Instead of integrating the vertices for all of ADS, what we're going to do is we're going to draw geodesics connecting the boundary points. Okay, so the, um, the blue lines are now geodesics. And we're just going to do exactly the same thing as the ordinary width diagram, so we're just going to integrate the vertices over the geodesics. Okay? Do that, then you can see here the vertices are not going to collide with each other because we're just integrating those geodesics. And because we're only introducing we have geodesics, we're not introducing any additional data that will break conformal symmetry. So this has the right conformal transformation property, and it's easy to show this obeys the conformal Casimir equation. And so in fact, and it has the right boundary condition, so that's in fact enough to prove that this is a conformal. I'm wondering if uh, this source is unique. It's well motivated, but is it? Could you argue that it's unique? Well, it's, it gives it gives a solution of the differential equation with the right boundary conditions. So, um, okay. In that sense, it's unique. Of course, I'm able to draw another picture that also has that property. It gives, it gives the right solution of the right boundary conditions. Okay. So there, we therefore call these guys geodesic Witten diagrams. And um, if you go and explicitly, well, so if you Right down the thing explicitly, you can get some double integral, right? You have an integral over the two geodesics, and then and then what you did here about the propagators. And then as I said before, that that, um, that double integral is is actually precise in this old um, uh, form of Ferrara and company. When you stare at this, you have to realize that this this thing here is basically the bulk full of propagator, 
these guys here are like both boundary propagators and uh, these integrals here are double integrals or for two GFS. It's happy to do a bunch of transformations. Okay, so that's, that makes those whole formulas similar. So in a sense, you may be summing up uh, only T channel or S channel, depending on the sort of position. So, yeah. So I mean, this is one, this is one conformal block. And so now another question is, yeah. So a sum of these guys, we can just sum, we we can reproduce the original Witten diagram by a sum over these ones. That's what I'll actually describe in a second here. So a sum over these guys in one channel. Yeah. I don't want to start summing over the whole blocks in different channels at the same time. Um, so here's actually how you now can compute that original Witten diagram as a decomposition to conform blocks. The nice thing about this, you can actually compute the Witten diagram in a sense without actually ever having to do any explicit integrals. Because all the integrals get absorbed into the definition of the conformal block. Okay. So let's go back to this uh, scalar exchange diagram. And let's try to compute this as a sum over conformal blocks. I'm going to be a little bit sketchy here. It's, it's actually not hard, but I'm going to find this few details. The basic formula allows you to do this is, um, so let, let's, let's analyze what's happening at this vertex here. So at this vertex here, we have two both boundary propagators um, meeting at that point. So that's what I've drawn here. So let's think of that as a function of y. Now there's a nice formula here that lets you rewrite product of two both boundary propagators meeting at a common point y in terms of a sum over um, functions sum over functions associated with conformal dimensions delta m, which is the sum of the two external conformal dimensions plus uh, 2m, where m is uh, uh, 0, 1, 2, et cetera. And these functions here, what are they? Well, these functions are um, defined to be um, solutions of the bulk wave equation sourced by, by sort with a source on the geodesic. Okay, so this is the picture here. So if you imagine source located on the geodesic, and then you have the bulk bulk propagator here, that will give a, a solution of the wave equation at y. So explicitly, these guys here are, this is gamma 1 to the geodesic, you, the source is the product of the bulk boundary propagators, you multiply by the bulk bulk propagator, this gives you a solution sourced on the geodesic. And then you can just prove this formula. I can go through this, but you can just prove that this is just working out the expansion of both sides and find that this is true. Okay. So, um, yeah, product two bullet counter propagators, sum over fields, source on the GFS,